Through Jesus, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. We've gathered this morning to do just that, to uh, confess the name of Jesus, to, to say that we love him, to say that we depend on him, um, to recommit ourselves in whatever way we need to, to pursue Jesus. And uh, we're glad to do that here in person. We welcome you. For those who are joining us online again, we're glad that you are able to do that and that though we can't see you, uh, we know that you're there and we pray the same things for those online as we pray for ourselves here in this room. Uh, our speaker today in the series, Why I'm Still a Christian, is Pastor Jacques Jacobs. And Jacques is a, um, a uh, local pastor. Now he'll be introduced more fully by Dr. O'Neill, who will read scripture for us this morning. We'll be led in prayer by Dr. Jonathan Kim. And our musicians this morning are Aaron Katner and Annie Knowlton, who come to us from the college uh, side and to lead us in our singing praise this morning. We have a brief announcement from Dr. Alan Lee, the Dean of Students, about graduate student government. Come on up. Good morning. Uh, so the Graduate Student Government Associ Association will be back in fall 2022, and we want to invite you to join the GSGA. What is the GSGA? The GSGA is a group of committed students who seek to serve the campus community through advocacy and service. The GSGA members will bring their unique gifts and passion to lead their peers into a meaningful community. There are three positions for the GSGA, the President, the Vice President of Student Life, and the Vice President of Academic Life. Uh, so if you're interested in being part of the GSGA to serve and be the voice of the graduate student body, please email me at deanstudentlife at tiu.edu or stop by my office in the Lower Waybright area. So let me share some dates with you. Uh, applications will be available and accepted from Monday, February 21st to March 4th, and elections will be from March 21st to the 23rd. So let me repeat, lastly, uh, again, the information, just in case you didn't take note, you can email me at deanstudentlife at tiu.edu. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Let's stand together, and we're going to uh, read responsively our call to worship from Psalm 131. Here we go. You'll read the part in yellow. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too haughty for me, but I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh, Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. Let's worship and hope this morning.
be seated. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, creator of the universe, giver and sustainer of life, we praise you and adore you. As the psalmist says, how precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Forgive our sins as you look at the speck of, of sawdust in our brother's eye. And pay no attention to the plank in our own eye. We are not holier than anyone. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on us, sinners, O oh God. Thank you for your everlasting love, unfailing faithfulness, and upright justice. Thank you, God, for our president, provost, academic dean, and other administrators who are tirelessly serving you and your servants in this institution. Thank you, God, for our faculty and staff who are devoted to serve our students, teaching, dialoguing, empowering, laughing together, crying with them at times, and encouraging them wherever and whenever possible. Thank God, thank you God for those beautiful hands and feet who make our dining room a place we want to be, hands that make our facilities clean in our classrooms and restrooms. Thank you God for those who maintain our campus roads clean when it snows. God, all of us need wisdom and strength from you. You are the source of wisdom and strength. Help us to lean on you, not lean on our own understanding. Even though we're going through challenging times in many aspects, we know you are in control. Give our leaders strength and wisdom to weather the storm. Help us, God, to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Renew our minds, hearts, so that we may obey your word in a whole new way. Speak to us, speak to us God, through your servant, Pastor Jacobs, this morning. Help us to receive your word with clear mind, open heart, open hand, and feet that are ready to act. May the name of Jesus be lifted high and higher than ever on our campus and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Trinity. Well, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, another friend of mine uh, to preach here in chapel. I'm excited. Uh, Pastor Jock Jacobs. Uh, Pastor Jock was born and raised in South Africa, and it is there uh, that he released multiple contemporary uh, Christian music albums. Um, that led to him joining full time ministry. And he was ordained in a, a mega church in, in Johannesburg. Um, he was raised uh, pastorally and ordained in the Word Faith Movement. And Jacques started and uh, built the largest youth ministry in South Africa in the early 90s. So that gave him a, an open door to come to the U.S. Uh, by invitation where he was trained to launch uh, new church campuses and church plants all under the Word Faith Movement. Now, some of you may be raising your eyebrows, especially if you know me. <laughs> why, why do you invite a Word Faith uh, pastor? Well, because in 2018, he had what he calls a, a personal theological crisis. 
um, as he continued to find out, uh, studying the scriptures, uh, what the Bible really has to say uh, about faith, grace, repentance, salvation. And uh, today, Jacques uh, pastors a church uh, that he founded in, in Schaumburg, Christ Nation Church. You can find that on ChristNation.tv. Uh, so we'll, uh, we're looking forward to uh, hearing some of your story and, and your exposition from Scripture to why you're still a Christian. Pastor Jock, thank you. Before we do that, would you stand as we read God's Word from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, and the verses will be 9 through 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. It's an absolute privilege to be with you all, and um, I count it an honor. And I'm actually kind of amazed that uh, you would invite me. <laughs> I said to, I said to Pastor Lucas, I'll do my best to not embarrass him, because, um, um, and I'll tell some of my story, and you will understand. But I grew up, uh, born and raised in South Africa, the very northern part of South Africa. Very uh, right next to the Kruger National Park, which some of you might know is the biggest uh, game park in the world, uh, on a farm. I'm one of the very few people my age in the world today that, um, at least here, that grew up until the age of about eight or nine without any kind of electricity. It was just candlelight, gas lamp, and fire, and life was good. And um, we traveled about 45 minutes to an hour to the first store where we could buy bread. And um, we went to a church about an hour away. It was a Pentecostal word faith church. And just to give you a little bit of my background, the very first pastor we ever had, he was caught stealing from the church. He stole money and uh, he was put on probation and when he came off of probation, he entered back into the pulpit, only then to be caught stealing money again the second time. Uh, then they found him dead. He committed suicide. He shot himself um, in the head. Our second pastor had a very, very unruly household um, to the point where we actually took in one of his daughters because she was so strung out on drugs. Uh, she lived in our home, and then only to find out that I have a sister who's two years older, and only then to find out that this lady we took in to help the pastor was a uh, lesbian. And uh, I would walk in on her laying, shaking on the ground. And um, for young kids, my mom decided that that's, of course, not the thing to do. Um, his sons were really, really wild, this pastor's sons. And eventually his wife passed away and the doctor said there was absolutely no reason for her to have passed away other than possibly a broken heart. The third pastor we, uh, we had, I remember sitting in the seats and every time he looked at me, my hands would start sweating because, uh, I don't know, I was just, you know, just, it was just kind of creepy for some reason, only then to find out that he and my sister's boyfriend... Um, had something going on. So 
uh, every single time, of course, our faith was shaken to its core. We um, joined a very large church in Johannesburg, South Africa. And by the way, my uh, first language is Afrikaans. English is my second language. So if I get my tenses messed up, you'll forgive me, I'm sure. So we joined this church, and um, it was a very large church. I was able to go to college. I studied opera to stay out of the military. That was the reason. (laughs) Because South Africa was going through so much trouble at the time. And then I took, uh, I became, I also did the course to become a concert pianist. However, during this time, I got to land a record deal with a Christian company and a a record company, and I started doing, you know, shows all around the country. And the pastors whose church I was attending at the time asked me to do concerts only within his area, and everybody that responded to the altar call which we had um, after every concert, I would give him the cards and they would follow through on those and have them join his church. You know, that went really well. He employed me full time and uh, immediately put me through Bible school, which was the Dale Carnegie course on how to win friends and influence people. That was the extent of my theological education, management courses. And um, He made me the youth pastor. We started a youth group, and immediately the youth grew. Uh, It became the largest youth group in the country. uh, But I'll tell you how we grew it, if that's okay. And all of this makes sense at the end of what I'm about to share with you. But I, um, my hair was all the way down to my waist, and and, um, I never changed my T-shirt. And it it was just kind of like the thing. And uh, we were very much... um, raised in faith, believing for stuff. The only proof that you are pleasing God is that you have a vision board that you can point to. This is what I'm believing God for because anyone who comes to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And if I cannot believe God for something, I have no proof that I have faith and therefore I have no proof that I can please God. And you are saved by faith. And so as a pastor in the church, in order to see if somebody is saved, you would ask them for their vision board. And um, everybody would pull out, and I'm a youth pastor, right? So everybody would pull out their vision board. And usually at the top of the vision board of every young guy, there's Pamela Anderson. I'm believing God for a wife such as this. <laughs> and I'd look at the guy, and I'm like, wow, you got great faith. Look at her. Look at you, man. <laughs> you got ways to go, boy. And... Um, People have big, big homes, mansions, cars, and the greater the vision board, the greater the faith they have. And if they have real great faith, we'll just put them in leadership. But anyhow, uh, we uh, started what was called Club J, Club Jesus. And I started a teenage dance club <clears throat> with DJs, and we had girl dancers, and we had security, we had um, bouncers, and Then we would just stop the music, and I would just preach for 30 minutes and give an altar call, have them come forward, fill out forms, take those forms, filter it through our process as we get them slotted into serving positions in the church. And we built a youth ministry any given Friday would be uh, close to 2,000 in attendance. was basically our capacity. And so we used clubbing in order to draw kids and get them slotted into our ministry. And in hindsight, that's one of my big regrets. And uh, on top of that, we were never taught on any kind of morality. Um, So you can only imagine, I don't actually have to talk to you about that, my own and those I was a pastor to. So having walked through the church, having had the experiences that I've had, and our faith was shaken over and over again by the pastors we had, and the absolute horrible theology that we held in our hands and everything had to do with numbers. It's the only thing. As a matter of fact, if you know uh, word, faith, word Faith preachers, I can tell you that um, there's an unspoken principle by which all of them live. And that is this, that he who can offer the greatest amount of hope will always have the greatest amount of influence. And so that's why you'll find ministers, 
God bless you, you favored, everything's going to go just wonderful for you. You know, there's a reason behind that, and there's, it, it actually works. <laughs> it actually works in a way. So what we would do is we would open up the Bible on a weekly basis to find a scripture we can throw our spin on to make it as positive as possible, and then we'll throw in a couple of prophecies in for free, and these prophecies always have great promises. So just to give you a little bit of background as to where I'm coming from, but... Uh, I ran headlong into a personal theological crisis about four years ago. It had nothing to do with money. It had nothing to do with a relationship in my family or my wife. It had absolutely to do with, I don't actually know what I believe. And, and I know I do whatever I want with scriptures in order to get people to do whatever I need them to do. And so... I think God took my conscience and just put it in an oven. And I tell my wife, I think I got saved four years ago. The only problem with me is I've been in the ministry 25 years at that time. And the regret I had about my own life and about where I encourage people to, when I open up the Bible or whether I put on a Paul Washer sermon, <laughs> I was waking up in sweats every night. The church that I served here in Chicago was a mega church. Uh, the one in South Africa was over 20,000 members, but the one here in Chicago was over 4,000. And, and my job was planting campuses. And so I did that about five times over in the last four, in those four years. And then um, I started realizing that it didn't matter what kind of success is out there, seemingly successful uh, efforts that I had. It was before God. And the church that I was serving at, believe it or not, this is actually, they don't encourage you to read anything except for the books that the senior pastor wrote and the Bible. It's not that they encourage you not to read anything. They discourage you, but they, but they frown upon in a big way if you read anything else. I remember walking up to the senior pastor with 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by, by John C. Maxwell, and he took the book and he threw it across the, across the room, and he says, garbage, not even good enough for a doorstopper. And so well, I'll be honest with you. Unfortunately, you know, um, when I came into men like Paul Washer, I didn't know that they were there. I just thought that they were old-fashioned, archaic, you know, men who are no longer relevant. And I started listening to men of the same, where they preached morality in a way, not necessarily moralism, but the fruits of the new creature. And I'm like, that's not me. I need help. And um, I got into the Word and I begged God to show me what does it mean to find the author's original intent in every verse that I read. And the Bible became a brand new book to me. My wife will tell you today she thinks I got saved two, four, uh, four years ago. <laughs> and so here I had a problem. I was a pastor of a church. And I was teaching them on a weekly basis on how to make money by giving to me. Not to me, but to the church, and the church has a board, and the church pays me. But. And so now, now what do I do? So I said to my wife, I think what I need to do is I need to just get up and tell the church. I'm that guy the Bible warned you against. <laughs> and uh, I've been wrong. And I said to my wife, and then what we do, after the church completely shuts down, uh, because everybody will leave, then we're going to move somewhere where it's cooler because I actually like it to be cold all year round. Growing up in South Africa, that's the one thing I'm so glad I'm away from, which is the heat. And um, anyway, so I did just that because over that last, that, that fourth year, um, it was very evident to everybody that, that something has changed in what I believe, starting off with salvation. Because I kept on saying that just because you prayed a prayer doesn't mean you're saved. 
but I've been saying the opposite since I started the church in Starbucks, streets of Whitfield in Schaumburg. And um, that's the way my wife and I started basically all the different campuses. We, we just started Bible studies, and then we filter people into positions, and, and we have a system over a nine-month period on how to start a church. And every campus we started was started with a good amount of people. This one started with uh, the one in Schaumburg. We had about 180 on our opening day on a Sunday morning. But I, I said to them, uh, I said to them, so, yeah, we've been wrong. I've been wrong. You know, I, I, I realized that what I've been teaching is completely out of line. And I started teaching salvation. And, yeah, we were right. People left in droves. <laughs> it's a big exodus. Men were angry at me. Over small things, like I would say, no, Jesus didn't die for you because you are so valuable. No. It wasn't your value he's after. It's because he loved you. And then men would come up and say, well, if I look at the cross, I see my value. I'm like, well, if I look at the cross, I see my depravity. He didn't come to purchase my value. He come to, he come to pay the penalty of my sin. What are you saying? My wife's not valuable. <laughs> I'm like, brother, you don't have to understand what I'm saying if you don't want to. But the church, people, people left in droves. But to our astonishment, about 45% of the people stayed. And so here, here we are today, still turning the ship, trying to help people understand biblical theology. So many in the culture in my immediate past has gone apostate and um, the collateral damage that lies in the wake of the word faith movement, the charismatic movement, the Pentecostal movement, the prosperity gospel movement, uh, the, 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 the collateral damage in the wake of those movements are incalculable. I'm looking at some of the people that used to be in the ministry with me, and many of the young people that were under the ministry, um, under my ministry, and for one, um, this lady that used to be our worship leader moved to South Korea, transitioned to becoming a man, married a man who transitioned to be a woman. And on my Facebook feed, I cannot believe just how her number one goal is to discredit God and scriptures. That's one example of many. Because in the wake of these movements, there's a tremendous amount of collateral damage. So I've had sufficient church hurt, sufficient theological confusion and doctrinal crisis in my life and sufficient increase, decrease in despondency in ministry to walk away, to deconstruct and become an apostate. However, today I want to explain to you as to why I am still a Christian. You see, I see it this way, that sin is birthed when, when, like Adam and Eve, we elevate ourselves as judge of what God has already said in His Word. That is what pride looks like. Eve knew what God said, but decided to believe what the snake said instead. Eve took it upon herself to judge God's warning as untrue and the snake's promise as truth. I know what it means to put a spin on scriptures. Eve ultimately judged between God and the snake. She elevated herself as judge over good and evil, taking it upon herself to define right from wrong. See, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus immediately stops him and says, Why do you call me good? Why do you put it, take it upon yourself to define the difference between what is good and what is not good? God is good. He defines what good means or the meaning of it. You do not get to define that. I don't get to define what love looks like. God defines what love looks like. God is love. Love is not God. God gets to define all terms. Do you, do you realize that all communication rests upon the definition of terms? We could have a conversation about love all day long, 
and talk about two complete different issues depending on how we, deter- how we define the word love. So here is a working definition of pride because I see that as pride. When somebody says to God, I'll define the meaning of love. I will define the meaning of compassion. I will define the meaning of justice. I will define all these terms for you instead of going to scriptures and allowing God to define these in our lives. So I figured out that a working definition for me on what it means to be proud is that pride takes from God his right to determine good from evil, right from wrong. Pride says you don't get to determine that anymore. I now determine what that means. I will tell you what love looks like. So in a generation obsessed with not judging others, they have become blind to their own judgment of God. Now, I'm just telling you about where the rubber hits the road. I'm telling you about where where I've come from, where we have transitioned from a fringe Christianity, if Christianity at all, into a biblically-based understanding of exegetical teaching. All I can tell you is that when people who were raised outside of Scripture's in the word faith movement, when they get to see who God is in the Bible, they for most part cannot, they can't swallow it. It's not palatable because it's not the God that they were taught when they were younger. And so they become judges of God. Pride will always judge God as not loving enough, not compassionate enough. In Luke 18, 13 four, through 14, Jesus was actually teaching us on, on humility. He says, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. He was in fact saying, God, I am not, I'm not here to judge you. I am the sinner, and you are here to judge me. I beg you for mercy. And Jesus said, he will go home forgiven. But the one who stands there thinking that they get to decide, God resists him because that's pride. So here's an example of how this generation elevates themselves as judge over God. I just wanted to clarify to you as to exactly what I mean because I don't mean to speak in between the lines, but I want to be very specific because um, we all live in a real world. I want to read to you a short list of influential figures in Christianity who have publicly deconstructed their faith, and here's why they did it. Because they judge God as lacking in goodness, they judge God as lacking in compassion, and they judge God as in not understanding or lacking love. Now, I can read these because they have publicly made their statements, but Kevin Max, one of the three lead personalities of DC Talk, he deconstructed his faith, believing that God was not compassionate or not the good God that he knew. God of the Bible was not the good God that he knew. Joshua Harris, the best-selling author of I Kiss Dating Goodbye, he deconstructed. Then you have Marty Sampson, the former Hillsong worship leader. And then you have John Steingart, front man from a Christian rock band, Hawk Nelson. I want to read to you what John said because I think this really makes a lot of sense. In his post on social media where he deconstructed, he says this, quote, I've been terrified to post this for a while. But it feels like it's time for me to be honest. I hope this is not to the end of I hope this is not the end of the conversation but the beginning. I hope this is encouraging people who might feel the same but are as are as afraid as I am to speak. I want to be open. I want to be transparent with you all and also open to having my heart changed in the future. When you grow up in a community, he says, that holds a shared belief, and that shared belief is so incredibly central to everything, you simply adopt it. Everyone I was close to believed in God, accepted Jesus into their hearts, so I did too. I became interested in music, began playing and singing in worship teams, and started leading worship at a church and youth events. Even then, I remember being uncomfortable with certain things, and now he's going to list what it was. He says, there were things that just didn't make sense to me. If God is all loving and all powerful, why is there evil in this world? Right. Can he not do anything about it? Can God not do anything about it? Does God not choose to? 
is the evil in the world as a result of his desire to give us free will? If so, okay then. What about famine and disease and floods and all suffering that isn't caused by humans and our free will? Then he finishes off, he says, I'd prefer if he, God, was there. But I suspect if he is there, he is very different than what I was taught. So in short, this is a great example of someone who sits as judge over what God may or may not do in scriptures, what God should and should not do say or have done, and what God can and cannot decide. I hope that makes sense to you, because this is where our world is at today. Job 32.2, but Elihu, the fourth man to speak to Job, became very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. Job 34, 12, it is unthinkable that God would do wrong, he says, that the Almighty would pervert justice. It's unthinkable that somebody would think that God would pervert justice, just as all these men, Kevin Max, Joshua Harris, Marty Sampson, Steingart, and the others, believe God has perverted justice. I'll prove to you that this is true. It is true how this how many church influencers today do exact same thing, judging God. All you need to do is put a Christian celebrity on the Oprah Winfrey show and then ask them this question. Does the Bible say same-sex marriage is a sin? What do you say? The moment you ask them that question, you've all seen it, they immediately start squirming. They start running around in circles. Can't answer the question. Can't answer the question. Because they will ultimately question God's judgment on that matter rather than disagreeing with popular culture. Job 40 verse 6 through 8 says, I'll just read you 8. God says to Job, would you discredit my justice? Would you do that, Job? Would you condemn me in order to justify yourself? Genesis 18 25, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is wrong? Of course he will. Well, it doesn't seem like it's right to me. Well, that doesn't mean it's wrong. God is just. And in light, of, in light of all of what I've experienced and the push to elevate myself as somebody who may have sufficient reason to walk away from Christ, I want to share with you why I am still a Christian. And I'll end with this. There are three categories. I want to show you why I am still a Christian after all of that. After all of what I've experienced in the church, the church hurt and so forth. Why am I still a Christian theologically? I want to show you why I'm a Christian relationally. And I want to show you logically why I'm still a Christian. So first, theologically speaking, I am still a Christian because who else do I have but Christ? Where else can I take my unresolved guilt but to the cross? I'm certainly not proud of my past. I kid you not. Being in the ministry for as long as I have been, and it's my fault. I'm not blaming anybody. But I literally thought Jesus came to save me from hell. I literally thought that was it. When I heard and read that he came to save me from sin and death, it was new. You have some of the most influential ministers in in the United States today that cannot use the word sin because it's no longer part of that Christianity. and That is actually no Christianity at all. They can't even say what Jesus came to save them from. But when God causes you to grow a a conscience (laughs) before him, it's almost like the only way I can express what happened to me. I would ask, well, who else do I have but Christ? Where else would I take my unresolved guilt but to the cross? 
Psalm 73, 25, whom have I in heaven but you? John 6, 60 through 69, we see Jesus was telling them, you know, this is right after he told them, like, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you'll have no part in me. And they started thinking, wow, cannibalism, really? <laughs> Are we going to follow him? So many left him, including some of his disciples. Jesus then in verse 67 asked, uh, are you guys going to leave me also? And that's when Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. So first, theologically speaking, I'm still a Christian because where else would I take my unresolved guilt? Theologically speaking, I am still a Christian because I persevere. But I persevere, why? Because God has preserved me. And for that, I'm forever grateful. Jude 1.1, 1, 1, to those who are the called and are kept for Christ Jesus. Thank you, God. Theologically speaking, I'm still a Christian because <laughs> I can't uncreate this new creation. Uh, you know, just like I'm not able to pull stars from the sky and stop the sun from shining, in the same way, can, neither can I undo this new creation formed and fashioned by God's own hands. Theologically speaking, why am I still a Christian? Because I can't unborn this new birth. Theologically speaking, why am I still a Christian? Because I can't make this willing heart become unwilling toward God. You go to like, why not? Because I don't want to. You know why I don't want to? Because he works in me both to will, to want to, and to do his good pleasure. And for that, I'm very grateful. Somebody once said, a man can surely do what he wills to do, but he cannot determine what he wills. Theologically speaking, I'm still a Christian because the fear of the Lord causes me to shudder at the thought of walking away from Him, of dishonoring Him. After everything He's done for me, I deserve none of it. Why would I want to walk away from God? I, I don't want to. Why? Because He works in me to will. And may He do the same for everyone here today. Theologically speaking, I cannot. I, I am still a Christian because I can't deconstruct what God has constructed. You see, I can't undo what he said he will complete. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. That is not my faith, it's his faith. For by grace you've been saved through faith and this. I mean, I'm a faith, faith preacher. I got that so wrong for th almost 30 years. Let me tell you, for by grace you've been saved through faith and that faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift from God, lest any man should boast. If you have a heart that believes and repents, you ought to fall on your knees and thank God with gratitude on a daily basis. Word faith people aren't thankful to God until their prayers are answered. Until they, their vision boards have been realized. Secondly, Relationally speaking, I'm still a Christian because I gave up bad company so good habits wouldn't give up on me. 1 Corinthians 15.33, do not be deceived. Bad company does what? Corrupts good habit. You see, the thing is, every single, one, every single time I read that verse, at least me, I would go like, well, that's not me. I wouldn't let them corrupt me. Only then to find out the beginning of the verse says, do not be deceived. <laughs> not only is that a warning, that is also a promise you will be corrupted. My wife and I decided when we realized that we've been wrong, when I repented before God, I couldn't stay in the group that I was in. I flew on their jets. I visited them in the mansions, in their mansions. And there were many of them. And you probably know just about most of them. But I can tell you now, that I gave up every single relationship. For four years, I didn't have one ministerial relationship. Not one. For the first time in my life, I started reading books. And that was my relationship. 
I've run out of time, but I, I can just tell you of some of the relationships that I've had to walk away because I know bad company corrupts good habits. Proverbs 13, 20 says, he who walks with the wise will be wise. He who walks with, in other words, goes where they go, will be wise. There's a transference of wisdom depending on who you, who you are with, who you lend your ears to. But it says, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. So we usually read this as a warning, but I also read this as a promise. Bad company will destroy me. I am not exempt. Who people walk with is God's chosen means by which he will preserve some. And remove the chaff from the wheat regarding others. Finally, I'm still a Christian today, logically speaking, because eyes they can see tells you nobody gets out of here alive, not one of us. I want hope not just in this life, but especially in death. And many today view Christianity as a faith that is outdated. Christianity is a faith that is archaic and no longer relevant at all. But I can tell you this one. Divine forgiveness and the promise of life after death is, in fact, the most relevant message to every single human on planet Earth. There isn't anything you could offer any human being that could possibly be more relevant than the very gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your grace and your mercy, for your goodness toward us. Your long-suffering, your kind. And today, may we feel your goodness and your grace and your mercy. May we know, Father God, that your word answers every problem we see taking place in life today. May we persevere because you preserve us. Amen. Thank you. You can stand and join us in worshiping our Lord and Savior.
May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with, every good, with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us go and please him today. Amen. <laughs>